to remain in the spacecraft. They will be hoisted aboard while still in the spacecraft. The flight director now uh, joshing the retro officer and asking him if he took into account that easterly wind, which apparently is going to put this spacecraft down very, very close to the, the USS Wasp. The WASP advises that the R&R section, the forward portion of the spacecraft, has hit the water. The WASP advises they're standing by for a splash. There is splash. 34 hours, uh, 34 minutes and 14 seconds after retro fire. Uh, we would estimate that splash occurred 72 hours and 14 seconds after launch. The WASP is closing on the spacecraft at a speed of 14 knots. From the deck of the WASP, we get an estimate of four and a half miles, four and a half miles from the spacecraft. Well, we'll go right into the uh, Q&A, and please wait for the microphone. Okay? Shoemaker with CBS. You did not uh, refer to this fatigue problem that caused you to uh, delay EVA a day. Uh, what, uh, who was tired, and what had made you tired? <coughs> well, three rendezvous in 21 hours. And also with that, uh, it's like anybody, you know, you go to sleep at night, and sometimes you sleep good, other times you don't sleep good. Well, uh, there were several factors beside this that really uh, entered into it. We were um, rather bushed, like we said, we talked it over after the third rendezvous, but also the fuel, after completing three rendezvous, our fuel budget was rather low. We did have a lot of experiments on board we wanted to perform, and station keeping on the unstabilized body, there was a chance that we could really reduce our fuel budget down lower and, uh, than what we had originally planned. All associated with that too, Gene and I had worked out this detailed investigation of extravehicular activity, specific work tasks, and if we'd go over to the ATDA at that time, uh, we weren't sure that we could get the shroud off because we knew of the You'd have to cut two of those cables, plus you'd have to then open the jaws up, get inside, and probably pull two connectors. And so we added everything up to fuel budget and also the increased fuel. Uh, we were slightly fatigued, and we wanted to devote full time and attention, and when we were station keeping, this would probably detract from it. So it was a series of factors. You mentioned uh, 
considering uh, trying to get rid of the shroud. Uh, do you think now that you, you could have gone ahead safely and either bumped it off or cut it off? I think that from what we know now, we made the, the right decision because of the body positioning uh, difficulties that Gene encountered. And here with the lower mass, this ATDA, he would have probably gotten a hold of it and sprung up on him and have a hard time positioning himself to perform a specific task. We had, uh, as you know, while we were up there, there was an investigation by a couple of our guys out on, on the coast taking a real good look and, and talking to them. Uh, it was one of those things that maybe could have been done and maybe not could have been done strictly from the, from the physical requirements of, of uh, cutting the shroud off because of there, there were a number of electrical connectors that could not be, be reached unless other things had been done previously. So it was a, it was a maybe situation. And uh, as we looked at it, uh, we had an EVA flight plan that both included a target vehicle or was versatile enough to not include the target vehicle and it really didn't compromise the plan. So our feeling was if we could get the shroud off to, uh, to give us an opportunity to dock, we'd go ahead. But if not, there was no real good reason then to do EVA at that time. So looking at it now, I, I think the shroud, we probably could not have got the shroud off because uh, of the physical requirements of the shroud and also because of EVA activity in terms of rotating bodies and non-stabilized bodies and positioning. Two. Gene, what do you feel are the lessons from your EVA experience in terms of Gemini 10, 11, 12, and long duration EVA missions? Well, I'll work backwards. I don't think in terms of long duration, if we're talking about two hours, three hours, uh, four hours, if we have a life support system and we take ample, uh, we pace ourselves so that we're not working against a hard or pressurized suit, I feel no problem in long duration missions at all. Uh, in terms of dehydration or anything else. Now, what lessons uh, have we learned? I, I've tried to depict some of the things we've learned and the things as far as Gemini 10, 11, and 12 are concerned. Uh, I, I've been going over with, with both, with all three uh, of these pilots and working specifically with them on some of their details and some of, some of their particular flight plan problems that they may have not anticipated that hopefully I can say, Really, this is not going to be as easy as we think it is. So we'd have to go into each one of those flight plans in detail, Jules, to, to say what we've learned. I think a great deal, though. But as a broad guide, do you feel a man has to move more slowly, take things easier, or what during EVA? Well, primarily, I think, number one, if we're going to do any transferring from one vehicle to another vehicle, we want a propulsion system. I'm not saying what kind of propulsion system, but I'm saying that the umbilical or a tether in terms of in terms of being used to get from one place to another is not adequate. Uh, I think we knew this. I think this was just a verification of that. Uh, I think we definitely want a propulsion system. I think in, in terms of maneuvering around our own vehicle, uh, just getting to that propulsion system, I think we want some positive handrails or handholds or some, something that gives us positive control of our body attitude at all times. Uh, another thing we're probably interested in is is uh, what are the problems of going to a non-stabilized body and uh, giving it a slight perturbation or impulse uh, when you actually hold on to it. Now, is this going to rotate the body? Is it going to destabilize the body? We've got a feel for this because one thing we did learn was that all, some, all these things, that these neg neg negligible and very small second, third order forces and terms now have to be considered because everything we, it's old Newton's law, every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, and this came home to us uh, very solidly during the EVA on Gemini 9. You also have to make sure you have a proper restraint system and make a complete analysis of the force vectors that are going to be applied for each task you do. I suppose the last part is for Dr. Gilruth. Is the chest pack being modified or changed in any way to increase its capacity, sir? Uh, Jules, uh, I think... Uh both things have to be done. I think we have to reduce the workload by providing better body restraint while you're doing tasks. You must realize that, that this is really the first flight in which people tried to do something in the way of work in space. We've floated around before, but this is the first time anyone's really tried to, to do, uh, put out foot pounds in space. And uh, so I think that both things need to be done. We have to see if we can increase the capacity of the, of the chest pack because we know now that you can, you can defeat it by working extremely hard, as, as Gene did. 
but it's, uh, it's not reasonable to work this hard in space, so we have to reduce the difficulty or the, what he calls the inefficiency of trying to position his body without sufficient handholds and footholds and restraint while he's trying to do a fairly complicated task. I think this is really the basic lesson. Hal Vanford, a powerhouse. Uh, Tom, you uh, talked about the degree of difficulty in uh, obtaining, visually obtaining the ATDA from above. Right. Uh, does, has this led you to any recommendations for the LEM? Well, I think it, it verified what uh, was brought out on the decision as far as, as the prime instrument for rendezvous on the LEM, and that's radar. And so we know that we've made the right decision by having radar on the LEM to take care of the type of rendezvous when you're above or below. So this just verified what we thought the assumptions were. Uh, Gene, from what we've been told about uh, the 10, 11, and 12 EVAs, it doesn't seem like 10, 11 is uh, comparable to yours, but the 12 is. And I was wondering if uh, you've come up with any specific suggestions for handholds or some kind of restraints that would reduce this workload. And then the second thing is you mentioned that you talked to the three pilots. And could you tell us who the third one is? Uh, thank you, Jim. Now, I, I haven't really talked to the three pilots that are concerned. I must retract that. I have talked to the two pilots, the 10, 11 pilots, because uh, I can't tell you who the, who the 12 pilot. I can tell you it isn't me. That may help. But uh, to your, back to your uh, first question, uh, yes, we are looking, and we feel that uh, that the restraint system, the bars and the footholds that we have now are not adequate for the, uh, for the 12 flight. We have not yet decided what is adequate because uh, we're pretty much of the, of the feeling that let's find out really how inefficient these bars are and where other bars or footholds or handholds might be more efficient and allow us to do the same job with half the work.